Good evening. Tonight I'd like to read to you the history of the electric vehicle. Chapter 1. Elon Musk invented the electric vehicle. He did it all by himself. No one else helped him. The end. Wasn't that a great story? Except, of course, it's not true. The electric vehicle is over 100 years old. There have been four great eras or generations for us to look back at. And in this video, I'll also talk to you about what technological change is required for us to transition to the next great era of electric vehicles. A good car show will organize vehicles into different categories. Vintage car shows typically put vehicles into different eras based on their age. The first era of the electric vehicle is the brass era. That's the same name used to describe all cars from roughly 1895 to 1925. Obviously, early vehicles used brass because it's a metal that's easy to work with and corrosion resistant. Later in this era, some of the components start to get chrome plated, but you get the idea. And it's the right name for electric vehicles of this time frame because EVs weren't considered abby normal. There was no normal automotive powertrain. Everything was new. At the turn of the century, steam power, internal combustion, and electric motors were all competing to become the powertrain of the choice for this fabulous new invention. By the way, the first U.S. president to ride in an electric vehicle was William McKinley in 1901. He had been shot by an assassin at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. On site was an advanced new electric-powered ambulance that took him to the infirmary on site. They were able to remove the bullet, stop the bleeding, but this was 40 years before penicillin was available for use. He died a few days later from infection. As you know, gasoline combustion engines ended up winning this competition. I should mention that diesel engines didn't come into use until the end of the brass era, and really only in trucks. Let's look at the advantages and disadvantage of each powertrain during this era. Let's start with starting. Steam engines generally use gasoline to heat up water in a boiler. It took about 30 minutes to build up steam enough to start your trip, so that's not fast. Electric cars, by comparison, were super easy. You just get in and go. Electrics were often advertised to women, doctors who needed to leave quickly, businessmen who didn't want to get their hands dirty. That's because combustion engines required the owner to start it with a hand crank. Not an easy task. That is until 1912 when Cadillac introduced the electric starter. It was developed by Charles Kettering of the Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company. He was asked to develop it following the death of an auto executive in Detroit who was injured when the car he was cranking backfired, resulting in serious wounds that led to infection and his death. Gosh dang it, this video is really starting off morbid. Anyway, that's a starter controller with a modern replacement battery. It worked well and was adopted by other manufacturers, taking away one of the key advantages of an electric vehicle. Electric vehicles were still more comfortable. I'm working on a more detailed video on Detroit Electric, so how about hitting that subscribe button if you want it to show up yeah, into your YouTube feed. I can tell you the enclosed cabin and electric powertrain allows the passengers to easily converse with each other while driving. Gas engines, by comparison, were very noisy and smelly at the time. If you wanted to go fast, that's where steam wins. In 1906, Stanley's Rocket Racer achieved a speed record of over 127 miles per hour. Electrics were slower and heavier than the other two, but at the time, poor roads and city ordinances limited how fast you can go. Electric vehicles were considered fast enough for the early years. Gasoline-powered vehicles had better range. During this time, EVs used lead-acid battery, although for $600 more, a couple of manufacturers offered an Edison battery that was a nickel-iron chemistry. Nickel is still used in EV batteries today, as in NMC or NCA batteries. For city use, electrics were more than good enough, and actually better than steam cars. Steam-powered cars were generally limited by how much water they can carry. The owner of this car said that at higher speeds, he blows off about a gallon of water every mile. Infrastructure for all these vehicles in the early days 
they all sucked. Steam cars used gas to make heat. Later on, some switched over to kerosene. And they needed clean water. Internal combustion engines also use gasoline, which is a byproduct of making kerosene for lighting. As a byproduct, it was generally available, but distribution was very limited at first. It took decades for gasoline filling stations to become readily available. Electricity, on the other hand, was all the rage, already being deployed in cities. Scranton, Pennsylvania, first used electric-powered streetcars in 1886. That's why it's called the Electric City. Michael, here's a map of EV charging stations in Chicago today. And here's a map of charging stations in 1916. I, I think this is awesome. If you look closely... Some stations are called out as being able to charge at 150 amps per car. Those are the first DC fast chargers. Well, well, technically, all the chargers back then were DC. There was no AC charging. Modern fast chargers typically have cables rated at at least 200 amps, going up to 5 and 600 amps. But back then, they were running at much slower voltages, so much less powerful than the systems we have today, but still cool as hell. But outside the city, electricity was almost non-existent. Electricity and steam were premium for vehicles. More expensive than combustion engine cars, steam was more powerful, electricity was more refined. In the end, gasoline-powered engines won because they did everything well. Their major shortcomings were addressed by the self-starter motor, and increased distribution of gasoline. Stanley kept making steam-powered vehicles all the way up until 1924. Detroit Electric kept making cars up until 1939, but the last several years, production was extremely limited. During World War II in the US, those electric vehicles that were still in running condition saw some renewed interest due to fuel rationing at the time, and it took automakers over a decade after the war for them to rediscover the concept of an electric vehicle. The 1960s and 70s saw a lot of experimentation. Jet turbine engines, the rotary Wankel engine, and battery electric vehicles. In the late 1960s, people looked up and noticed that the air quality sucked. Major cities were shrouded in smog caused by automotive exhaust and other burning things. Electric vehicles were seen as one way of cleaning that up. What really sparked interest, though, was the oil embargo in 1973. Long lines and high gas prices got people thinking about alternative powertrain. One vehicle in particular did make it to production. Sebring Vanguard of Florida made the city car, later called the commuter car. Again, a small, slow, wedge-shaped commuter car over 4,000 were produced from 1974 to 1982, and you can still find some for sale today. It was the most successful EV since before World War II. Car buyers were amused by these tiny electric vehicles. Government regulators, on the other hand, were very interested. The California Air Resources Board felt that electric vehicles were almost ready for mass adoption, to further help improve air quality. They also knew that automakers needed to be persuaded to make them. I call this next era the nickel metal hydride era. That's a, that's a terrible name. How about we call it the pre-modern era, featuring nickel metal hydride batteries? That's better. In 1990, CARB adopted the Zero Emission Vehicle Program whereby 10% of vehicle sales for a given manufacturer would need to be zero emission by 2003. ZEVs were not required to be an electric vehicle, but at the time, that was the only viable means of achieving it. And the largest automakers got busy. Now, I said these vehicles featured nickel metal hydride batteries, but at first, some of the earliest vehicles launched with old, proven lead-acid batteries, and then they transitioned to nickel metal hydride. You have the Chevrolet S10, Ford Ranger EV, Toyota RAV4 EV, Honda EV Plus, and of course, the GM EV1. 
Awesome. So what happened? I mean, who killed the electric vehicle? In 1996, CARB modified the regulations that allowed automakers to do things other than BEVs. They allowed partial zero emission vehicles. Basically, it gave automakers an out. Electric vehicles that were tooled up and ready to go still went forward, but they had a very short production run. Critics of the change will tell you that these cars were awesome, but in reality, their range was still lacking and they were very expensive for the automakers to make. How, how do I know this? Well, I actually did work for an organization involved in seeing the EV1s through the end of their lease, managing the spare parts used to service and keep them running. And I can tell you, the cost to make a replacement motor or controller was astronomical. They were very advanced for their time, but with such low volume, they were expensive as hell. Automakers pulled back any leases they could so as not to have to deal with providing service parts. The only vehicles that remain today are those that were sold as a purchased vehicle and not a lease. It's sad what happened to many of these electric vehicles, but not surprising. They were the best EVs in decades, but still a little compromised. The real crime in this is that the engineering groups put together by the automakers to design these electric vehicles were quickly disbanded, and the engineers were reassigned to do things like make SUVs and pickup trucks. Had they kept them together, they would have been able to take advantage of the next great generation in battery technology. Now you'll get to hear about the one, the only, Martin Eberhardt. We'll get to Elon in a minute. I'll oversimplify the events that happened. AC Propulsion, they're a company that specializes in motors and controllers for electric vehicles. Their founder, Alan Cocconi, worked with GM on the original concept for the EV1. In 1997, they built prototypes of the T0, based on a kit car running on aftermarket lead-acid batteries. Seeing that consumer electronics were moving beyond nickel metal hydride to lithium-ion batteries, they decided to convert one of the prototypes to use the more advanced battery. Martin Eberhard, an engineer-entrepreneur, learned of the T0 with lithium-ion batteries, drove it, loved it, told his former colleague Mark Tarpening. J.B. Straubel, another engineer-entrepreneur, learned of this car and mentioned it to Elon Musk. Elon had made a boatload of money on an online banking idea called x.com. That's right, I said X, which later became PayPal, and now X is back again. None of them could convince AC Propulsion to ramp up production of this fast sports car, so they decided to do it themselves. Tesla Motor forms in 2003, the Roadster goes into production in 2008, the Model S in 2012. Yes, there were other battery electric vehicles along the way. The French-made Venturi Fetiche predated the Tesla Roadster, but sold in very limited quantities. But no other company made the impact that Tesla did. And yes, for all his madness, Elon Musk needs to be given credit for the modern era of EVs featuring lithium-ion batteries. Comparing them to Henry Ford is pretty valid. Neither of them was the only one making cars during their era, but both completely transformed the auto industry during their times. So those are the four historical eras of battery electric vehicles. So what's next? It's pretty clear that battery technology will be the catalyst for the next great era of electric vehicles. The postmodern era of electric vehicles will begin with a transformative leap in battery technology. And we kind of already know what the likely candidates are. For premium electric vehicles, solid state batteries are being developed and are likely just a few years away from limited production. To be clear, most solid state batteries under development still use lithium. They just replace the liquid electrolyte with a solid electrolyte for better performance. Chinese EV maker NIO already has a semi-solid state battery in production. It is the first step forward towards a solid state, very impressive, but it's not quite there yet. It's a safe bet that a Chinese EV maker will be the first to bring a solid state battery to production. But I wouldn't get too excited when they do. 
being first does not guarantee success. And we shouldn't overlook the less premium side of electric vehicles. Lithium iron phosphate batteries are more affordable. They've been hugely popular in China for years and are starting to catch on in Europe and North America. An even more affordable option could be sodium ion batteries as that next transformative leap. They're currently under development and showing great promise. Sodium is the next lightest element amongst the alkali metals on the periodic table, just under lithium. Those are just two of the battery technologies that could mark the beginning of the postmodern era of electric vehicles. When will that happen? Your guess is as good as mine. Another guess might be when I'm gonna finish my videos on historic EVs. I had a chance to look at some of them. So I'm working on putting those out real soon. Now would be a great time to subscribe to this channel so they show up in your feed. Thanks for watching.